Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. I promise you that every single one of you are going to walk away from here today being inspired, motivated, and hopefully encouraged to be stronger and going deeper with your walk with God. Are you guys ready? All right, let's start in Genesis chapter 26, verse 1 through 6. Let's read this. It says, now, there was a famine in the land. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like the word recession. Anybody like recession? Okay, well, this recession was like no other recession. There ain't no famine like this famine here. Isaac is experiencing some crazy famine. I mean, I know when you and I think about the worst recession that we've experienced in our generation, happened in what, 2008, right? Remember that? As a matter of fact, we opened this church on recession. That's how you know that this is a well from heaven. Because to, to start a church in recession, in the middle of it, I, you got to be crazy. Literally, you have to be crazy to start something when you're in recession. But when it's God's super on your natural, man, you got some supernatural things that happen. So Isaac is going through a severe famine. It's not just famine of, of food, which was a huge issue. They were lacking food. They were lacking substance. But this type of famine was food and water. Now, I know many of us, we can live at least for two weeks without food. Some of you, maybe not. But, but water, let me tell you something. But when it comes to water, we all need water. You need, so there was a famine of food and water. That means there was no agua. And they're looking for this. And they're in the depths of this severe famine in the land. Now he says this. He says, now besides the previous famine in Abraham's time, so obviously there's generational moments in our life that things happen and and have you noticed that stuff repeats itself isn't that the way our culture is it repeats itself well well in abraham's time abraham was the father of isaac abraham also had to endure a season of famine but obviously isaac had enough seed in his life he had enough 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 spiritual maturity and and sustainability to understand oh i remember something like this and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. But the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. And isn't that so true when it comes to our walk with God? When you or I get in trouble, when you and I are being challenged, when we're facing some very difficult situations, the first thing we want to go do is we want to go to Egypt because Egypt is good. We start going to people. We start going to places, places that God never called you to go to. We start hooking up or linking up with people that God never called you to connect with, to link up with. But that's just like our human nature. When we are in trouble, we tend to find a way, our own fleshly way, to try to appease the circumstance that we're facing. But how many know that God is faithful in every season? He's so faithful that God appears to Isaac. He says, yo, 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 whoa, 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 where are you going? He's like, I didn't tell you to move. I didn't tell you to leave. And isn't it so much easier to just quit when things are tough? Isn't it just so much easier just to move to another state when there's a famine of work in the land? We are so fleshly, right, that we begin to make decisions based on our feelings and not based on what God said. Now, don't get me wrong. I get it. There are times when you will hear from heaven and heaven will say to you, okay, it's time to, for you to move from here to there. It's time for you to move from this job to that job. But very rarely do I find people that have had an encounter with the living God, not just by chance. I mean, when I, when I see people that heard from God, that's because I know that there is some type of connection between them and God, and I believe them. And then there are those other people that just bring out the God card. Well, God called me. To, no, it's like, no, God didn't call you to do that. You, you, you're just taking the easy route. You just want to quit. You just want to give up. You just want to go to a different place. Why? Because you're trying to run from your problem, but the problem is you. You're still going with you. 
You can, listen, you can move country, but you're still there. You can move churches, but you're still there. You can move anywhere you want, but guess what? At the end of the day, you are still there. And so God appears to Isaac and he says, you're not going to leave. You're going to live through this famine and I'll be with you. Let's keep reading. So the Lord appeared to Isaac and he said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Verse 3, he says, stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and I will bless you. How many want the blessings of God? Come on, man, then you better stay. <laughs> huh? I ain't joking. You better stay. Stay put. Maybe right now you're in a season of, man, some tough stuff happening at work, and it's just easier to quit and go get another job. Maybe that's not what God wants for you. Maybe God wants to grow your character right there. Maybe God wants you to lead someone to Jesus right there. Maybe God wants you to encourage someone right there. And you're just like, no, nah, but they don't like me here. Well, guess what? They didn't like Jesus either. Jesus said if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Why are you special? He says, but if you stay, I'll be with you. But if you stay, I'll bless you. And he says, for to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and I will confirm. I love it when God confirms his word. I, I like, I soup. Do you realize that God spoke Japan into my heart 15 years ago? When God spoke to me about Japan, I'm like, Man, how was this little Mexican kid going to do in Japan? You know what I'm saying? I got no education, right? I, I'm just, I'm like, I'm a nobody 15 years. I'm just like, just trying to figure this thing out. I'm just trying to obey God. But how many know that when God makes an oath, God keeps his word? And not only does he keep his word, he will confirm his word as you're walking faithfully and consistent with him step by step, year by year. He'll start confirming things. He'll start putting his approval. He'll start putting his blessing on it. People will start looking at you and say, man, there's something, there's a, there's a little something, something special on you. And so he says, he says, he'll keep the oath. He'll confirm it. My example is coming to New Hall, California. I'm like, man, when I got here, I'm like, Newhall. Now, I know a lot of you, you look in here and you're like, oh, how beautiful. Well, you, you weren't here when it wasn't beautiful. It, it was ghetto when I got here. I mean, we had prostitutes, gangbangers, drugs. I mean, I'd be walking out the church and someone's right there making a deal. I'm like, what the? Like, can anything good come out of Newhall? You know what I'm saying? That's what I felt. Newhall, Santa Clarita. I didn't like Santa Clarita. But how many know that when God confirms something, he confirms it? And if it wasn't for the obedience, if it wasn't for the, the trust and, and the faith to just say, okay, God, I don't want to be here, but I will stay here. And if it wasn't for that, I will stay here, we wouldn't be experiencing all the things that we've been seeing globally and locally. Your decision, your decision, your life will also ultimately bless someone else's life. It's not just about you. It's about what God's going to do in you and through you. And then you watch it. Listen, some of you, y'all y'all owe me big time. You, some of you do. You find your girl here. You married. You lucky I said yes. Uh-huh. You owe me. Yeah, you owe me big time. Anyways, let's move on. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, ever say your offspring. That means parents, your children. And through your offspring, your children, all nations on earth will be blessed. In other words, he says, I will bless the world and I will bless your children through you. That's, that's what God's trying to say to us. And because Abraham obeyed me, and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. Let me tell you something. Isaac obeyed God, but he didn't just obey God. So many times we hear a word from God, and, and God gives you an oath. God swears to you a promise. And most often what the church looks like is like this. We just keep sitting on our rusty dusties, and we're just like, okay, I'm just waiting on your blessing, God. Pastor told me to stay. And we're just like this, just like, okay. 
and, and month after month, year after year, and, and you're just like, God ain't blessing me. And what do we do? We, we default back to that old person. We default back to that old cycle. We default back to that old attitude. We default back to that old conduct. We default back to that old behavior. Why? Because I ain't seen God do nothing. And when God's, listen, when God's not doing nothing, it's not that he's not doing nothing. He's waiting on you to do something first so that he can bless. And so what does Isaac do? Isaac got to work. Isaac started putting his hand literally to the plow. And he started working as he was waiting for God. Let's keep reading. Look at this. So in the midst of your circumstance, guys, you got to do something. You can't just accept your circumstance. You can't, you can't just sit there and accept your sickness, your disease. You got to do something. You got to do something. You can't just sit there and accept your famine. I don't know what famine you're in. Maybe you have a famine in your finances. Maybe there's a famine in your marriage. Maybe there's a famine in your children going cray-cray. Maybe there's a famine in the workplace. Maybe there's a famine in your leadership. I don't know what famine you have, but you can't just sit by and watch yourself go through the famine, your drought, and die. You got to do something. Every single one of us, we can't just keep sitting on chairs every single week listening to messages or on our vehicles listening to sermons or playing worship and we just expect, okay, God, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. God is waiting on us to do something in the midst of a famine. Let me explain to you because I don't know about you, but I want to keep progressing. I want to keep growing. How about you? And I want to see my finances grow. I want to see my children grow. I want to see my family grow. I want to see the church grow. I want to see everything grow. Anything that I touch, anywhere the sole of my feet touch, I want to see it prosper. I want to see God's success. I want to see God's provision. I want to see God's vision come to pass. I want to see everything God has for me. But, I, but it's not going to happen me just sitting by, praying all day, which I believe in prayer. But listen. Prayer is the foundation. Doing is the action. Faith is the action. Amen? And so look, so, so Isaac listened and obeyed God. And look what he does. Verse 12 of the same chapter says, And Isaac planted crops in that land. Mind you, there was a famine. What is the first thing he does? He starts working the ground. Oh, yeah, amen. Amen. You start working that ground. You know what? Some of us, our famine is in our attitude. Start working that attitude. Some of us, that famine is our faith. Start working that faith. Huh? Romans 10, 7 says what? Faith comes by hearing and by hearing and by hearing the word of God. Where is your famine? Work it. You got a famine in your children? Work it. You got a famine at the workplace? Work it. Literally, work. I never get a raise. I wonder why. I wonder why. That'd be my, don't come get counsel from me because I'll be straight up with you. I wonder why. Because the last time I checked, the people that are the top producers never come with that kind of mindset or even conversation. I'm going to be doing a series on leadership soon too. So Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year look at this and the same that means that the moment you decide to get to work on that same year it didn't say the same day right we say a prayer like okay god where you at right pastor laid hands on me what happened it said in the same year it didn't say what part of the year it could have been on the last month of the 31st of 2019 the problem is that we become so overwhelmed with our own feelings that we begin to suppress the very word that God is trying to plant inside of you that's trying to birth out the blessing the breakthrough the miracle but we can't wait because it's going to take a whole year and that doesn't mean a year where you're on and off like you're in church one month you're off for three months on hiatus and then you come back no that's not the way it works when God says follow me he says follow me Daily, weekly, monthly, at work, at home, 
at Starbucks, in your car, follow me. And he says, and he blessed that land. And on that same year, he reaped a hundredfold. Man, a hundredfold. A hu How many would like to just reap a hundredfold in your life? Just a hundredfold of blessing and peace. A hundredfold of having not just enough, but having more than enough to be a blessing. But look at this. He had a hundredfold, and here's the reason why. Here's the equation. Because the Lord what? Blessed him. See, I don't know about you. You could either have your blessing or you can have the blessing of God. Like there's your blessing, okay, which is like limited. Then there's God's blessing. And God's blessing has been on this church. He has multiplied it. He has multiplied it not just here, beyond here. It's because it's his well. And he will fill this well. Let's keep going. So God's, listen, one thing I learned about Isaac is that God's blessing is what was accelerating the very ditch, the very well that Isaac was digging. God will, ex listen, you link up with God, he'll accelerate your healing. You link up with God, he'll accelerate your spiritual growth. You link up with God, he'll accelerate your family. He'll accelerate your marriage. He'll accelerate, he'll accelerate in, in ways that, man, when people, when people ask you, well, how is that possible? Man, you're going to be like, man, I'm hooked up with God. You don't even know, man, I'm so hooked up with God. I'm so linked up with him. And verse 13 says, and so the man became rich, and his wealth continued to grow. Come on. It sucks when people come to a limit in their walk with God where they just can't grow beyond that anymore. It's like they just hit a cap. I've arrived. No, you haven't. Like we should all keep growing and then growing some more and then growing some more. Not just spiritually. In our leadership, we should be growing more. Come on. In our family, we should be growing more. In everything we do, we should be growing more. But if you just come to a place where you felt like, okay, now I have enough. No, that's not, that's not God. God is always about growing more, increase. God's about elevating people. God's about taking it up to the next level. God is always wanting to grow. And he says, and so he continued to grow until he became very wealthy. I mean, one thing is being rich. Another thing is being very wealthy. Rich has to do with money. Wealthy has to do with his soul. He was wealthy in his soul. He was wealthy in his mind. He was wealthy in his spirit. He was wealthy in his physical body. This man was not only rich, but wealthy. How many want that kind of wealth? That's some crazy rich stuff. Verse 14, and he had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. When you start taking God serious, people are going to envy you. When you start being serious about your walk with God, I'm telling you, people are going to tell you stupid stuff like this. Why are you always going to church? Why do you have to serve today? Why can't you just miss a Sunday? They envy. Why are you always happy? Why do you, why do you smile now? Right? Like, why are we praying for our food? That's weird. Like, they will envy. They will envy. It says, and so the Philistines, they envied. They envied the fact that Isaac, that he just kept being blessed, that he kept having a hundredfold. Think about it. In the midst of a famine, God is blessing him a hundredfold. In the midst of whatever famine you're facing, God can bless you just to show people how blessed you are with your God. So all the wells. They would say all the wells. So when people say, you know, why are you so blessed? You just say, well... So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham. Parents, listen to me. He's talking about his father Abraham. His father Abraham passed something on to his son Isaac. That's why it's called Abraham, Isaac, and what? Jacob. God not only cares about you, dad. God cares about your son, and God cares about your grandchildren. See, the greatest gift is not passing on the baton of stuff to your kids. I get it. I love my kids. 
I got my daughter here in the front row. I love her. Yes, I want to give her a house. Yes, I want to leave her money. Yes, my son. I want to leave them stuff. But the greatest gift that any parent can give their child is when you give them the baton of a love for God. When you give them the baton of a love for God, they will love God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their strength, with all their mind. And there is no money on earth that can pay for that. You have to leave something. You got to leave something. There must be a spiritual deposit, Dad. Spiritual deposit, Mom. It can't just be stuff. It can't be work all your life and die and you left them an inheritance of money. That's cool. I like that. Leave me something too, but it ain't. It's, it's not about that. I got to pass on a baton of a love for Jesus in my children. And so all the wells... Man, that his father's servants had dug in time of his father Abraham. It says the Philistines stopped up. The Philistines cogged up. Do you realize, mom, dad, right now, that you and I can cog up our child's blessing? I don't know about you, but I want to unclog some things. I, I get it. We, we were envied. I, I get it. We, we have haters but, but here it says that the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. That means that every day Isaac is just coming. He's coming to the wells, and, and God is filling them supernaturally. And they have this, this eternal water, this supernatural, like God is providing. But let me tell you something. In every generation, no matter how good you've been with God, we still have an adversary who's going to come and clog up the blessing. Regardless of what, of what a righteous grandmother you were, what a righteous mom you were, what a righteous dad you were, it don't matter. There's going to come a time where the enemy is going to clog the blessing that you have tried to transfer to your children. But because you gave them the baton of love for Jesus, they're going to know how to respond. They're going to respond the way dad responded. They're going to respond the way mom responded. They're going to respond with, God will meet all my needs. God is my healer. God is my redeemer. God will restore. Looks like This looks like a job for Jesus Christ, and then they start going to work. But check this out. They filled, the enemy filled literally every single well of blessing. Can you imagine waking up and your well of health is gone? Huh? I've been there. One day I'm working hard in church. Man, I probably had like five, 600 volunteers under me. Had like over 80 leaders that I raised up. Man, this is when I was in ministry before having my, our own church here. Let me tell you something. I was great one day. Had a big event, and it was amazing. 12 or 1 or 2 in the morning, woke up with horrendous pain, ended up in the hospital. And on that day, that doctor by 2 p.m. walked in the room and said, you have Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. Come on, just like this, from one day to the next, the well of health was gone. What happened? The enemy came to clog it up. He came. I had always been healthy, never sick a day of my life. As a matter of fact, the first day I ever missed work, ever, ever called in sick to work, was the day I landed in the hospital. Never missed one day of work. Not one. I'd go to work sick. Now, I don't, I don't recommend that. I'm different. Not one day. I've never called in sick. Took my vacations, and that was it. And one day, just like that, like Isaac, woke up, and my well was clogged and death came knocking at our door and the philistines are looking at this and they're thinking like what it kind of reminds me of my dog anybody have dogs any dog lovers let me show you my dog this is one of them bear this is bear no don't even fall for that don't 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 even do that and you show the other one here's another one of bear so when he's in trouble that's what he does when i go bear he always comes to me and he gives me that puppy look. But Bear, Bear's saved. He's a Christian. <laughs> he is. He's a Christian. He's, he's, he's more Christian than most Christians I know. And uh, 
he 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 jacks up my my backyard like he he's always digging holes in my backyard and it ticks me off because every time he digs a hole i have to go grab the shovel i have to grab the dirt and i have to start filling uh, that hole again and then of course only to come back and there's another hole so he's super spiritual he's really spiritual he understands the <laughs> digging he's like i'm digging a well praise god <laughs> what does it have to do with me come on dog <laughs> spilled a well no no what i'm saying is this is like listen here yeah that's funny you, here i have my dog and he and he's always like digging digging just doesn't stop and he'll be there and like shh and i'm like oh, okay that crazy i have to deal i have to sweep it back up inside there but he's just digging wells. that's how god wants to see his kids constantly digging wells of revival constantly digging wells of prayer constantly digging wells of breakthrough constantly digging and maybe listen maybe your well that you're digging right now it may not be for right now but it's going to be for a day when you're going to need it most why because you did the work sooner than later by the time that famine comes god will fill that well too many of us wait till the last minute and then we're trying to get it all together god's like listen i'm a proactive god I'm telling you right now, start digging wells of revival. Start digging the well of my presence. Start digging the well of prayer in your life, in your heart. I want to get to know you deeper. I want to have a connection with you. I want you to not only encounter me, but I want to encounter you. I want to stop you when you're going to the wrong places. I want to stop you when you're about to make that bad decision. I want to stop you in your tracks. Why? Because there's enough rapport between you and me that I have been given permission to say, whoa you're not leaving live there amen, amen. so the philistines they're haters they they filled up the wells <sighs> filling up the blessing and i get it because sometimes i have felt in my own personal life as a pastor i feel like i got momentum you know there's times where i got i feel like man we got momentum in our family Man, we got momentum in our church. Man, I feel like, man, we got momentum in our finances. We got momentum in our health, feeling good, feeling strong. Got momentum in my personal growth. But let me be honest with you. But I've also felt moments in my life where I felt like I'm being buried with anxiety. There's been moments in my where I feel like I'm being buried with depression. Like oppression starts trying to creep in my life. I, 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 so there's been times where I, I've, been, I've been buried with doubt. Like, like when I travel to another country, I'm like, what the heck am I doing here? I don't belong here. That's doubt. See, the enemy, the Philistine, they're trying to come. The enemy is hating, envying what God is doing with Elevate Church, and he's trying to bury that. But let me tell you something. If you stay hooked up, linked up, connected with Almighty God, let me tell you something. God can undo everything that the enemy has done against you. God can undo all of it. God can undo all of it for your children, for your family, for your church, for your job, for your, instead of trying to fight and try to be right at work, how about just go ahead and trust the God who can fill your well. You just steal the well of prayer and let God fill it. Amen. Bible says that a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 more at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Give God a better hand clap. Don't give him a golf clap. Give him a, yeah. Look at 1 Peter 5 eight. Let's not be foolish, guys. It says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion. Notice it says, like a roaring lion, not a lion. What does that mean? He pretend. He's a deceiver. He makes you believe that he's something that he's not. So all he can do is be an imitator of something that he can never become. He's a lower level angel and he envies the angels of the most high God. But he does walk around like a roaring lion looking to whom he may devour. 
So we also have to know that, yes, there is a spiritual enemy that we have. And, and God's saying, stay alert. Be alert. Pay attention. You know, because I know that in church you don't hear the word devil anymore. Why? Because it ain't cool. Because people may leave the church. I don't give a rip. Leave. There's a devil, and he hates you, and he envies you, and he can't stand you, and he wants to see you completely destroyed. Why? Because you're a child of the Most High God. But greater is he who lives in you than he that's in the world. And you have to know this. you got to know this. If not, then I don't know what gospel you're listening to. Amen? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Stay alert. But then there's also, what do you clog up? Can't blame everything on the devil. Can't keep saying the devil made me do it. No, what did you clog up? You can tell when you're clogged. Like, have you ever forgiven a person? And, and you're like, I forgave them. Yes. Then you see him again and this. <laughs> like you were good for a minute. Like it was like, okay, we're good. And like, hey, sister, <laughs> I love you from afar. Or, you know, I forgive you. But then like, like weeks go by, months go by. And all of a sudden this resentment, this anger, you know, clogged. You got a clogged artery. It happens. That's how easy it is. And when you start, when you start allowing yourself to just stare at your well that's clogged and not doing anything about it, you'll stay that way until you do something. It won't, this will not unclog itself. This must be unclogged by you. Me. And God said, and I will be with you, and I will bless it. So you can keep waiting on God all you, all you want. You're going to be one miserable Christian. Be waiting a long time. Or you can hook up with God and say, you know, God, I, I, right now I can't do this in my own strength. Will you help me? And he said, well, guess what? I actually gave you a helper. His name is Holy Spirit, and he lives inside of you. And his name is Helper, too. Now, he ain't the doer. He's the helper. And he wants to help you lift up your shovel and start digging a brand new well. Amen. For some of us, it's let's not dig a new well because that'd be easier for you to do. How about let's redig the well that you filled and let's get life back in that well? Are you hearing me? Yes. And, and be careful because once you go back to that place where you know you've been clogged, self hatred starts just filling your heart. You hate yourself. And, and, and let me tell you something. That right there, when you have self-hatred, you're not hating what you did. It's that Satan has already got a stronghold in that place or that sin that you and I have created. That then he begins to use that against you. And that's where that self-hatred, because the only word, when, when you think about the Bible, the only word that's a strong word is the word hate. And Satan is the author of it. So what do I do, Pastor? Unclog that hate and let love fill you. Love cast out all fear, but you don't know what they did to me. Love cast out all fear, but they betrayed me. Love cast out all fear, but they hurt me. But they love will cast out out all fear the listen in the multitude of your sins God loves you what happens we we forget to protect our well what happens we forget to guard our wells what happens we forget to work our wells Do you realize that even a good well can be polluted? You can be a good person and be polluted. 
You can be a good Christian and be polluted. Polluted with fear, doubt, anxiety. That's pollution. You got to address that place in your heart. Let me finish this. Let's get out of here. Verse 26, or chapter 26, verse 23. It says, then he went up. This is Isaac. He's now responding. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I'm, I'm the God of your father Abraham. Don't, don't, do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there, and he called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a what? Well. See, instead of complaining about what the enemy did, just go ahead and redig the well that the enemy clogged. Because you can talk about it all day, all night, and they did this, and she did that, and he did this. And let me tell you something. The only bitter water is you. You're the only bitter water. That's just you. Everybody's having a sweet time while you're bitter. You're still stuck. You can stay stuck for a long time, but you've got to redig. And you know how you start? You build God an altar in your heart. See, many of us, we bow down to, to unforgiveness. We bow down to bitterness. We bow down to lust. We bow down to hate. We bow down to doubt. We bow down to fear. God says, you know, why don't you stop bowing and build me an altar and make me the altar of your heart and bow down to me because I have the name that's above every name. And his name is Jesus. Can we give God a big shout of praise? Come on. Just tell him, thank you, Lord. Yeah. Give him a bigger shout and just say, yeah, Jesus. Yeah. His name is higher. His name is greater. His name goes deeper. His name is Jesus. We need new wells of revival, new wells of awakenings, new wells of encounters with God, new wells of prayer. We need altars in our heart that bow down to Jesus and Jesus alone. That's what we need. Hmm. Isaac opened up the wells again they had been dug in the time of his father Abraham the Philistines and stopped them up after Abraham died Isaac gave the wells the same names his father had given them and Isaac's servants dug wells in the valley and there they discovered fresh water let me tell you something when you choose to dig your well you're going to have a fresh fire a fresh anointing a fresh perspective of God like it's going to be so fresh your drought will end. Because I know there's people sitting here today. You're dry, man. You're dry. Like, like, you even wonder, is God real? Is, is this even legit? Is, just, is this just hype? Is, just, is this emotion? No, let me tell you something. No, it's faith. We trust. We believe. God loves you. On, you're blessed. You're here. You're alive. You can be laying in a hospital bed, but you're right here right now. You can be sick. Your kids can be in a very dark place. Maybe they are. Listen, God can't revive them until you're revived revive you and they get revived you gotta fan the flame you gotta stir the gift that's within you stop being so worried about everybody else and just focus on you and it's not let me dig a well for my blessing no let me dig a well so that when I dig this well there'll be other people that'll come and drink from me that's why the woman at the well, remember that? She came to the well, right, trying to draw water from, guess whose guess who's well she was drinking from? Jacob's well. And then she's like, hey, girl, give me some water. She said, I ain't getting no water. She's Samaritan, you know. We have no dealing, we have no dealing with you Jews. And he said, if you only knew 
the whale that's talking to you. He's like, you'll come here, you'll drink, and you'll be thirsty again. But the water I give, you'll never thirst again. He's like, where do I get that well from? I want, where, I want some of that water. And Jesus said, well, girl, didn't you just say you didn't want any? Oh, no, I want. And he's like, okay, go get your husband. I don't got no husband. He's like, you're right. You got like five men right now. <laughs> See, you may be good in one area, but you may be bad in five. And God says, bring me your five men. Bring me your five issues. And let's drink. Because you'll never thirst again. In other words, God's not afraid of your sin. God's like, just bring it to me. He's not afraid of your fear, your doubts, your unbeliefs. He's not afraid of, of where you've been. God, All God wants to know is, hey, will you be in relationship with me? Will you obey me? Will you allow me to love you, forgive you, give you a hope with a future? When I look at the eyes of the Japanese people, my heart breaks, man. Because they look at me and they're just like, 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 don't leave. And it's like, and parts of me says, I'll move to Japan. Like, I actually say, I'm like, maybe I should move to Japan. I'm not saying I'm serious, but, but if God told me to, I'll do it. I'll do it. See, until you see the eyes of a person in their eye when they're hopeless, when they're just like, come on, man, just, and they just want more, just like, stay, just, just, ah, when are you coming back? Ah, my heart's like, oh, I wish there was two of me. But then I have to remind myself, there is Devin and Mie there in Japan. The people at your work should look at you in the eye and say, how do I get what you have? What is it about you? And you know what you say? Well. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.